please welcome Gary Anderson. Thank you. Thank you guys for inviting me here. I'm always delighted to talk about journalism because it's something I remain passionate about. You'll have to excuse my uh, voice. I'm in the midst of a cold, which I have probably spread across half the nation on my way here. But, um, by the way, has anybody suggested you do this in June? Um, I, I'm not going to talk about uh, what happened years ago, although we'll have time for questions afterwards. Uh, and you can ask all you'd like about it. I'd be happy to answer. But what, I'd like to talk about a couple of other things. Um, first of all, um, I mean, all the changes in journalism that you all are going through, the technology, the internet, the loss of traditional journalistic jobs, the blurring of just what is journalism and who is a journalist. I think it's really important to remember just what we're supposed to be doing and who we are. We are people who find and tell the truth as best we can. That's it. The tools aren't really very important, um, although I have to say I'm stunned by the new and exciting ways that we have now to tell stories that we're just beginning to explore. I don't mean just multimedia, that's old hat, as you all know. But now even the venerable and venerated New York Times, the proverbial old gray lady of journalism, is producing stories in virtual reality. And so is my beloved AP. I mean, to an old hack like me, that's science fiction. And, and I don't know where it's going, but I do know we also have to remember why we do this. I mean, certainly not for money, unless you're a lot prettier than I am. We all know most journalists aren't very well paid, and certainly not the increasing number of independent journalists or freelancers who are filling the places once held by full-time foreign correspondents and even domestic staffers. I'll have more to say about that in a little bit. And of course, we don't do it for peace of mind. It's difficult and increasingly dangerous, more dangerous than it's ever been. We're now acknowledging more openly the damages that reporters suffer themselves in covering the violence of the world, whether it's a war or the aftermath of a hurricane or a horrifying shooting at a school. So why? I have for years looked at the young people in my journalism classes and tried to explain how important what we do is, while at the same time being frank about the difficulties and the dangers. Sure, it's exciting, I say, but it's often boring or painful or just plain unpleasant. We certainly don't get much thanks for it, do we? We all know how journalists rank somewhere around lawyers and the distaste the public has for us. These days, they don't even believe as much if what we have to say is contrary to their dearly held opinions and beliefs. You know, there was an old cl cliche, the old guys will remember, you could have your own opinions but not your own facts. And now if you don't like the facts, just reject them. Truth is whatever you believe. No, I tell them we do it because we still somehow believe it's important. As you know, I'm honorary chair of the Committee to Protect Journalists, a fine organization that monitors attacks on the press around the world and works on behalf of journalists in danger or in jail and for freedom of the press in general. In more than 20 years as a board member of the CPJ, I've met dozens and dozens of journalists in trouble. People from around the world who go to work every day not knowing if they're going to be free or even alive at the end of the day. They're beaten, they're kidnapped, they're shot, they're jailed or just disappeared. In those 20 years, 1,185 journalists that we can count have been killed in the course of their work. More than half of them were simply murdered. And rarely is anyone even charged, let alone convicted of those crimes, because frequently the murderers belonged to or were hired by their own governments. Still, they continue to do it. They continue to find and tell the truth because they know it's important. 
And you know what? So do the people who do it to them. The people who give and give the orders and carry out the murders and kidnappings and beatings. They know they cannot oppress their people. They cannot steal from their people in the face of a free and active press. So they go after the journalists first. You cannot have a free country without a free and active press, period. That includes this one. These days, many of those facing danger, venturing into dangerous and difficult places, aren't lucky enough to work for fine organizations like the New York Times or the AP or Reuters or many of your great newspapers. They are often young people, often just out of school, inexperienced, sometimes ill-trained. Even if they are able and experienced and well-trained, as many of them are, they are usually ill-paid and ill-supported. Hell, some people even think journalists should work not just for little, but for nothing, and be happy for the exposure. Emma Beals, a fine young independent journalist, wrote this in the Frontline Freelance Register. It's a long quote, so I won't bother with she said, she said until the end, because I agree with everything she wrote. She said, Stephen Hall, editor-in-chief of Huffington Post UK, recently stated on BBC's Radio 4, if I was paying someone to write something because I wanted to get advertising, that's not a real authentic way of presenting copy. When somebody writes something for us, we know it's real. We know they want to write it. It's not been forced or paid for. I think that's something to be proud of. This statement, Emma said, is irresponsible and it is dangerous. It's dangerous for the state of journalism and dangerous for journalists themselves. Quality journalism costs money. Mr. Hall suggests that only writing which isn't paid for is real. But who is paying for it if the outlet isn't? Public perception of journalism and news media is that it is increasingly partisan and untrustworthy. Inviting unpaid content seems like an excellent way to invite special interests and lobbyists to speak their mind. Writers, photojournalists, and videographers have rent and bills to pay, and sometimes they might want to eat or drink or take a holiday. The best way to ensure journalism is well-researched and ethically sourced is for an outlet to pay the cost of reporting it, plus a fair rate for the journalist's time. It is surprising that this even needs to be pointed out. When was the last time you saw chefs asking to be paid for the food you eat in a restaurant or an electrician publicly begging for change for replacing your busted fuses. At Frontline Freelance Register, we also believe that fair and timely pay is a safety issue. Our members work in some of the most dangerous parts of the world. The news industry, with its shrinking foreign bureaus and cutbacks, increasingly relies on our members and other brave journalists to bring news of what's happening around the world into our living rooms and onto newspaper pages. Reporting in war zones, in areas of political or civil unrest and change is expensive. A good fixer, a driver, hotels, insurance, safety equipment can run into the hundreds or even thousands per day. Someone has to pay this. Often news organizations don't cover expenses or expect freelancers to cover them personally and then seek subsequent reimbursement. This can take months as many news organizations classify journalists as vendors who fall under the same finance protocols as the photocopy company or the people who deliver the water coolers. When freelancers aren't paid properly, they cut corners. Perhaps they try to work for several clients at once or take a cheaper driver that's not so trusted. Maybe they stay in the firing line longer and closer to sell more work to cover the expenses. Perhaps they don't take out insurance because the cost would mean they wouldn't break even. A business model that requires journalists and local media workers, drivers and fixers to bear the cost of producing news is not a business model at all. The Huffington Post was acquired by AOL in 2011 for $315 million. Last year it was valued at $1 billion, due in no small part to the 200 million unique visitors it gets each month. But how many of those visitors understand that the news they read is generated at the expense of journalists? Successful campaigns have meant consumers now worry about whether their eggs come from battery hens whose lives are made miserable so suppliers can profit from cheap eggs. 
Fair trade coffee is now pervasive because it was deemed unreasonable for workers to toil in the field for slave wages. Clothing producers are now held to account when their factories fall below minimum standards of safety for workers. But with news, consumers have not yet caught on to the fact that the information they read is not always gathered ethically. That freelance journalists are sometimes exploited and imperiled. It is up to consumers to demand that the media they consume is gathered as ethically as their breakfast. That's from Emma Beals in the Frontline Freelance Register. That's a new association of freelancers who are trying to work to make things better. My daughter Suleme is also an independent journalist based in New York who covers the Middle East. She writes for Atlantic, Vice, Foreign Affairs, and others. She just got a piece accepted by the New Yorker, which we're very proud of. As a father, I tremble every time she goes out there. But I'm also very proud of her because she's good. She says, paid a living wage? We're not. There's just no way to get by. Journalists are dropping out. We can't afford the things that keep us safe. That's what in some ways happened to James Foley. He didn't have a fixer who could tell him, don't do this. There's no protection. If something happens to you, you're on your own. I reminded her that just last year, uh, more than 30 major news organizations, that's now up to 90, have signed on to an agreement that if they were going to use freelancers, they would treat them the same as staff. They would offer support, they would pay them decently. That doesn't seem to be bearing much fruit just yet. Suleme says, I know people who were negotiating that agreement, they said they got bullied. When it came down to the nitty gritty, the editors were not interested in changing their business model. That business model, she says, is unsustainable. They can do whatever they want. You don't have much of a say in anything. They can drop a story whenever they want. They can take months to pay. When I was starting out, a news organization tried to offer me $100 for my first story. I went to the Syrian border, a village occupied by ISIS, who had just left, and interviewed Syrian child brides. It took me two months. I got $250, and that was a victory. Editors are overworked. They aren't compensated much better than we are. They have to make concessions. But people who are bearing the brunt of these cuts are the reporters. We're the ones risking our lives. To pay a reporter $100 or $300 is atrocious. Because there are people who are very committed to this job, who feel a passion and a calling to do journalism, we're taken advantage of because they can. They know we're passionate, committed. In what other industry is this allowed? She says we're losing something. There'd be a robust and driving press. People don't know what the governments are doing anymore. People get the news they want, not the news they need. The conflict between journalists and the businesses they work for has always been sharp. But these days, with more and more media owned by larger and fewer corporations, it's threatening our purpose, our reason for existing. The First Amendment is there because the Founding Fathers felt that strongly about the need for a free and vital press. Do we still feel that strongly? Uh, I talked to Emma, by the way, uh, by phone yesterday on the way here. Uh, she's in London. And she gave a little more hope. She said that the 90 organizations, including many the major ones, AP and New York Times, and AFP and Reuters, um, are talking with them and trying to set up some help, things like a, a, a common insurance pool for freelancers, which would be helpful, and some training and some other things. But the talks on wages aren't going real well. That's always the hard part, isn't it? You know, a lot of you guys are editors, or you may become editors, or managing editors, or publishers even, vice presidents of news organizations. Um, the next time you pick up a story from an independent journalist, domestic or international, think about what that story is really worth. Think about the work, the risk, the danger, and the effort that went into it. Then think about your budget and your owner's profit. Then write a check. And don't dump it in with the bills that will be paid next month. Put it in the mail. They need it and we'll all profit from it. Now, we could go on and talk about problems in journalism. God knows I do it all the time. And uh, there are lots of them. 
But, you know, I think it's more important that we recognize that the continued triumphs, the wonderful journalism that is being committed all across the United States and the globe. People, the AP Sea Slavery series, which was brilliant, uh, and the New York Times piece on the outlawry of the sea. Of course, you might suspect they stole it from the AP, but shh, it was brilliantly done anyway, as always. Uh, the ICIJ, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, has done some incredible work coordinating investigative journalists in you know, 15 or 20 or 30 countries on banking secrecy and on international corporations dodging taxes. And, you know, there are still fine papers in every major city, including this one. I mean, go look on the walls in there at the great journalism that your people are doing. Um, yeah, papers are under siege. We call them legacy journalists. That means we're old farts. Um, but there are still Lots of good newspapers and dozens of serious new internet-based organizations that are learning how to do news in the, in the new age. You know, and every semester, I just retired in December. I've been teaching at various universities, University of Florida most recently, and every semester I look at my classes. You know what? They're all full. They're all full of bright young people. And despite the warnings, I mean, no professor in a J school is anything but frank about the problems that we have and the difficulties it's gonna be. And when I teach international journalism, I have to tell them, you know, those plum jobs like I had for great organizations, they're harder and harder to come by. You're probably gonna end up getting some money together and putting yourself on an airplane and plopping over to some country and trying to learn how to live on almost nothing while you build a reputation and, and a portfolio until you can build some strings. And maybe even like some of the young journalists that I've seen, some that I've taught, catch on with the AP or a major news organization. Or even like Rukmini Kalamachi, who was a freelancer and then went to the AP and now is working for the New York Times, who steals all our best people. Um, it can be done. It is being done every day. And that's what I prefer to look at and what I prefer to remember. To remember. And one other thing before I let you ask whatever you want to ask. Uh, I think, without going into any politics, our country is in serious trouble. Um, that a lot of people are angry because our system seems to be broken. And we don't know how to fix it. Guess what? Uh, just as we are responsible for some of that breakdown, we are responsible for providing ways to fix it. The Founding Fathers were right. The First Amendment is important. You cannot have a free, and I will add, functioning country uh, without a free and dedicated press. And that's who you are. That's who you need to be. Thank you. I'm uh, happy to ask, uh, as much time as we have left, ask whatever you like, but I'm going to sit down because I'm old. Uh, somebody start. Stick up a hand. Come on. Are you bashful? Yeah, go ahead. Can you talk about your Um, Which part of it? The part as a journalist or the part as a hostage? Um, you know, okay, you're, you're asking a single question that's going to take a long answer. Um, I thought that job as chief correspondent for the, uh, chief Middle East correspondent for the AP was the most exciting and difficult job I've ever had or could ever hope to have. Um, and uh, what happened basically was I had done covered violence in Asia and Africa and then the Middle East for a number of years. Um, the, um, the AP discovered that when, when the AP discovered that as an ex-Marine I could handle that sort of thing, they just sent me out to do more and more of it. And uh, 
I got arrogant. You know, I'm not part of this, I'm just here to watch. And I went out one day when I shouldn't have. Most of Western journalists had left Beirut. The AP's president, Lou Bacardi, came to Cairo and we met with him and he said, should you leave, Terry? The New York Times has just pulled out their correspondent, it's too dangerous. And I said, no, I can handle it, it's important, I'm going to stay. Well, that was a dumb answer uh, because they came and got me and tucked me away for seven years. And I'm not going to tell hostage stories. You can, I wrote a book 20 years ago, you can read that, it's still around. Um, it was not fun, believe me, it was terrible. Um, and it was very long. Uh, but I was lucky I had, for most of that time, I had about a year and a half in solitary, uh, which, by the way, nearly destroyed me. And as I will remind you, we are discovering is destroying prisoners in our jails and prisoners every day, including teenagers who are put in solitary as a matter of administrative decision. It is soul-destroying. Um, but I had companions for most of that time, and we kept each other alive, and we kept each other thinking that one day we would go home. And most of us did. Is this microphone on? Maybe it's just not pointed properly. Where did it go? Okay. Eventually, we did go home, most of us. You know, we forget in the wonderful celebration of the ending of that period uh, with my release uh, that a good many hostages didn't come home, that they died in prison. Uh, and I always remember them. Uh, but we came home, and America rightly celebrated what seemed to be the end of a very bad period. And uh, I was stunned by my welcome home. I was absolutely stunned. And people have been so nice. I mean, inviting me here. Why did you invite me here? It's not because I'm a professor of journalism, right? It's not because I've written about journalism in the Middle East in the last 20 years. It's because I'm a former hostage and you recognize my name and you know I'm a journalist who had to pay for taking too many chances. And that's okay. You know, one of my friends <laughs> said when I first came, well, how does it feel to know that no matter how long you live and no matter what you do from here on out, that when you die, your obituary is going to read, Terry Anderson, come a former hostage. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Twenty-some years later, that's still the way you think of me. That's okay. That's okay. I'll tell, tell you a secret. I use that recognition. I use that recognition to say things I think should be said like this. I've used it to raise millions of dollars for the CPJ and for my own charity, the Vietnam Children's Fund. We have just built our 50th school in Vietnam over the past 20 years. And we've already, we're already working on our 51st, see? So I can do things with that that are worthwhile. So I don't mind. Yeah. Mr. Anderson, uh, just to talk about domestic issues for a second. What's sure. your views on the coverage of the presidential election? The coverage of the presidential election, it's atrocious as it has been for the last several presidential elections. Um, I don't want to get politically partisan, okay? I have my beliefs and I have my stands. But damn, when will we stop covering presidential elections as horse races and trying to figure out who's got the latest advantage and allowing people to get up there and talk for hours without ever mentioning you know, important ideas and policies and details of how the hell they're going to do what they're promising to do and catching them up on their lies and saying what they are, which is lies. We're allowed to say that, you know. I mean, you can figure out a way not to use the word lie if you want to, but they are. 
And that's part of our job too. We're so scared of being accused of being partisan that we won't come out and say, excuse me, sir, that is not a fact. And that certainly is not what you said the last time around. We are allowed to do that. It is part of our job. I am so worried today because we exist in two separate universes. I mean that literally, universes where the laws and facts in this universe simply don't seem to apply over here. A fact is not a fact. History is not history. The truth is not truth because the people in this universe don't want to believe that. Excuse me, come here while I hold this brick over your head, okay? Now just stand there while I let go. Let me explain what a fact is. It doesn't go away because you don't like it. And that somehow I, I, I have this feeling that that's, much of that is part of our failure. We have failed to hold them accountable. We have failed to do our job, which is telling the truth. There is truth. It's not relative. There are facts. And science, by the way, is not a theory. It is a means of determining truth. You can't not believe in science. You might as well not believe in math. Okay? Uh, and yet, I, these guys and women get up there every day and they say these things and we let them get away with it. Because we're so caught up in the horse race and who's gonna get the advantage on whom and who's feuding with who. That's not real journalism, is it? Come on, how many of you like doing that stuff? How many of you think your readers really want to want that stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, how much time have we got? Um, I teach diversity. I'm looking out at this crowd. Hi. No, not you. The one black face that I can see in this crowd. Welcome. Hi. Um, you know, we're all intelligent people and we all have diversity programs in the newspaper and we have, I, you know, we have this goal. We ain't doing worth a crap. We are. Look, just look at the room. It's self-evident. Um, diversity, it's not just a theory, it's necessary. This country is becoming a country of minorities. You all white guys aren't going to be in charge anymore. You're not going to be making the rules. And as leaders of opinion, as makers of opinion, uh, you really need to recognize that you need some different input. You know, you, you need to have some different voices, some different faces, some different backgrounds. We are doing better with women, as you know, uh, although still a struggle for senior jobs, isn't it, ladies? Editors and managing editors and things like that, it's still a problem, but we are doing worth a damn for ethnic diversity. So, there you go. I wish I could explain that, but why don't you come and take one of my diversity courses and we'll spend the next three months on it. Yeah. Political correctness, the way it's taken today, is a stupid term. It is taken today as a criticism. Something that's wrong and bad. Well, nah, I'm not going to be politically correct. Political correctness is an effort not to insult people, not to demean them by using terms and words and phrases that are hurtful and damaging. That's what political correctness is. And yeah, college campuses, sometimes they take it too far. That's what college campuses do, right? I had a big discussion with this with a guy the other day. 
we, we, he brought it up, political correctness. Now, and you know, I'm really confused about this, uh, this microaggression stuff. What is that, microaggression? And I tried to explain, okay, people of color, women, uh, gay people, they run into things every day that are demeaning, insulting, at a kind of a small level. That really, you know, they have to live with this every day. They don't want to get upset. They don't want to break up the conversation. They want to cause an argument. So they just let it go. Okay? I'm not going to make a fuss. Dirty joke. You know, blonde joke. Not going to make a fuss. Happens every day. Every day. You don't think it does? It does. Ask any of these women about mansplaining. Ask them what they think. And that builds up. You know, that is a level of, uh, of, of aggression, of, of, of insult that, you know, you don't have to live with. You know, you don't think about it because you don't have to live with it. And what we're doing at universities when we're talking about microaggressions is we're trying to figure out a way to address this. And we don't know. And certainly I don't have the answers. I'm an old fat white man. You know, what did, what did this guy say? He says, well, they have to learn to just to put up with a certain level of insult. Okay, I'm going to tell a black person that he just has to put up with a certain level of racism every day. And that's an answer. No. We need to figure this out. And where do we figure it out? Where do we talk about these things? We talk about it in universities. And we try to come up and among intelligent people. And we try to come up with things. And I, I, you know what the answer is? Don't do it. Think about it. The answer is not for black people to change. They can't change me in black. And they don't want to change me in black. The answer is you, white man. Recognize that some of the things you say on a regular basis are insulting and stop doing it. Okay? Um, and the world will be a better place. And that's hard, isn't it? Because number one, uh, it's not a single white person in this room was a racist, right? We don't have racists. Right? Isn't that amazing? And two, you don't want to change. It's painful. You got to think about it. You got to be aware. You just can't be your old blundering self and just go along making jokes or saying whatever it is you want to say. You got to, you got to be aware of how you sound and what it means when you say something or when you tell a blonde joke, what it means to a blonde person, or God forbid you should tell a rape joke where the chances are there's some woman in the audience who's, or in your crowd who's been raped. Now, does that sound like a bad thing? Does that sound like something that should be dismissed as a, you know, ah, sh I'm not going to be politically correct? It doesn't to me. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you think I became an international journalist? Uh, zoning committee meetings. Um, I don't find that you need to. I don't know what your experience is, but I get lots and lots of young people who are just dying to get out there and get a job on the, on the local newspaper. They're desperate. Uh, they want that experience and they know they have to pay their dues. That they, you know, I don't know. What's your experience, guys? Are, you, are the young people that come to you uh, unwilling to do the gut work? Hmm? Well, I don't, you know, you're the, you're, you're the ones dealing with them on a the job. I just send them out to you just as full of starry eyes and hope as I can. It is important work. You know, every time you send a reporter to a zoning commission meeting or a city council meeting, you are taking part in that grand fight for our 
constitutional rights, our human dignity. That's part of the fight at a very real level. If you're not there, you know what's going to happen, don't you? You know, some years ago when I was in Kentucky, the fine little newspaper, the Herald Leader, went out and did some basic reporting. God bless them. They asked for the expense accounts for the public-private airport commission. You know, there's a whole level of government, public-private, and they often say we're not public, so we don't have to tell you anything. And they went to court and they got them. And guess what they discovered? Those guys were going to girly clubs in Louisville. They were patronizing nightclubs in New Orleans. They were spending millions of dollars of basically public money. It all comes from, you know, taxes. And they wrote a story. And then they went and they checked the library board. And damned if they weren't doing the same thing. And they kicked off a whole statewide series of stories by all the local newspapers and everybody looking at this whole field of public-private organizations, the water board and the, all these things that actually, the, oh, the, the Association of Counties and the Association of Cities, that was a good one, because they fought in court, we're not public, we're private. Yeah, but you're getting dues from the cities, so that makes it public money. They lost. And was anybody surprised at the level of corruption? Not particularly. And I just call that's good, basic, solid reporting. Ask for the expense accounts. And wasn't that a contribution to the public good? Hmm? And, uh, you know, that's what that local reporting does. If anything's being hurt by the move uh, to internet, I think it's, it's monitoring local governments. I, I don't know, you're out there. But budget cuts are really hurting state houses and state reporters and, and county government reporters, and I think that's dangerous. I don't think that's good for us. But then I'm an old-fashioned kind of reporter who think journalists should do reporting and monitor our leaders. How much time we got left? We're good? I'm happy to talk more. Thank you, guys. Thanks.